welcome to the Bodybuilding Dietitians podcast. Today you're joined by your hosts, Tiara and Jack. Thank you so much for tuning in for our ninth episode of the podcast today. We've got a really good one lined up for you. So today we have a special guest on the show. His name is Brandon Kempter. And Brandon is a professional natural bodybuilder here in Australia and head physique coach at BK Conditioning. So I'm going to hand over to Brandon to introduce himself. Thanks, guys. First off, I just want to say a massive thank you for having me on the podcast today. I think the project, this project is absolutely fantastic. You know, getting some more information out to our sector of the industry is uh, totally priceless. So uh, as mentioned, thanks. yeah, thanks again. And um, as mentioned, my name is Brandon Kemter, uh, and I'm head coach at BK Conditioning. And basically, what we do is we specialize in uh, preparing natural athletes for the stage, and um, we specialize just in the, the bodybuilding uh, aspect within that. And yeah, that's what we do. Great. Okay. So, Brandon, we know that you are a bodybuilder yourself, and you certainly yeah. practice what you preach. So can you give us a bit of insight? So where did your bodybuilding journey begin? Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, I started lifting at around 15 years old. At that point in time, I lived, uh, of course, with my family. and We lived out in the bush. So access to a gym wasn't really uh, doable, in which case mm -hmm. I got very creative. Mm -hmm. uh, I do remember cruising down to the back paddock and chopping down a couple of pine trees to build a chin-up <laughs> bar. I uh, also built a self-spotting rig. Uh, around my little bench press because at the point in time everyone was talking about failure is the trend of failure is the only way yeah. so um I had concrete bags to lunge with and whatnot so definitely got creative there really loved it and it was about the time when I got my driver's license where things got a bit more serious I finally had access to a gym and I was like a kid in a, in a candy store absolutely loved it and I had the uh the the pleasure of, of having some good mentoring from the get-go once I entered the gym scene, which meant that I wasn't, um, I didn't have too much faff time. So it was too much muck around time at the start of my career. Mm. Which meant wow, you're that, very fortunate for that. <laughs> absolutely. And that's, again, that's with what I do professionally these days, it's a big passion of mine is, is really helping the up and coming guys, you know, get educated as soon as possible. And obviously natural bodybuilding requiring such longitudinal thinking um, it's important that you get these young guys off to a good start so that comes, you know, you know, when they're hitting juniors, et cetera, you know, they can, you know, uh, hold their own in the opens if, they, if, yeah. if done correctly. Mm. So I started, um, in the gym around 17, really enjoyed it. Uh, at about, I was 18, rather 19 when I first got on stage and about a year out from that, I decided I wanted to do this show. Uh, and really started kicking it up. And again, having mentoring was really uh, instrumental. At that point in time, flexible dieting was really just emerging. However, being so uh, tech savvy and uh, sort of connected as we all are through social media and at that point, like bodybuilding.com forums, I was yeah. flexible dieting from the get-go, which is fantastic. And for me, the real attraction of getting on stage wasn't so much to win. In fact, I walked into my first show. I had no idea if I was good at this or not. Mm. For me, what attracted me was just like, man, this is hardcore. And the kind of hyper analytical side of me just loved having the opportunity to control nutrition and training and persuade my body for a really specific outcome. Mm. Uh, so I rolled into that show. I actually, I rolled into it late. And uh, at that point in time, the only tan available was that horrible acetone-based contest oh, color. Man. And my <laughs> skin does not take tan. So I put six coats of that, showered the morning of the show, rolled in there white. Oh, totally my gosh. <laughs> with a tub of dream tan and thanks to a couple of uh, fellow competitors, which I'm still in contact with to this day. So Rash Somali and uh, Brendan Pocock, thanks you, thank you guys. They helped tan me and chucked me on stage. Uh, I ended up walking away with a, a first place as a teen, which blew my mind because obviously I was quite ice the bodybuilding crew at the time. Mm -hmm. And I went and competed through states at uh, that point, uh, went to nationals, enjoyed it. And from there, that's where it all kicked off. I, um, at that point, I was studying as well. 
And I went again in 2014 as a junior, did pretty okay, again, sort of top three placing. And then 2016 was kind of my, my big year. I took a couple of years off. I needed to grow. Uh, I was no longer a newbie, so it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. How, how did you find dealing with that? Because clearly you're so passionate about this. And I think that's, yeah. that's a huge um, mistake a lot of people run into is trying to rush to the stage again. So how did you hold yourself back during that time and know that, you know, waiting and being patient would be worth it? Was it difficult? Oh, surely. I think... I think for some it's really difficult because they associate the stage with as the sole point of enjoyment. And for me, the process was equally as enjoyable. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, bodybuilding in a lot of ways has taught me some fantastic lessons, more than just uh, the gym itself. But personally, I'm a very, very impatient person, or I used to be at least. And bodybuilding really taught me how to slow things down, be methodical, think longitudinally. And that's they're sort of points that have had positive, contrib- you know, positive contribution to every aspect of my life. Mm. Uh, and I think also mentorship, you know, just having the right people in my corner. And I think um, that is also a really having the right people in my corner personally has also been instrumental in sort of my trajectory in terms of staying natural. I'm super passionate about natural bodybuilding. However, I was once very influenceable. So having yeah. other natural bodybuilders that I looked up to to say, hey, you got to think long term. This is natural bodybuilding. This is how it is. I didn't yeah. know any other way. It was you're taking mm. two years off to grow. Uh, don't go again next year. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. You are incredibly fortunate that you had that mentoring from such an early age. <laughs> True. And, um, True. <laughs> So when did your, I guess, career in health and fitness sort of kickstart in this period? Yeah. Um, again, I started really early on that side as well. Um, through high school, we had a program where you could do a Cert 3 in fitness and whatnot, which is great. Uh, mm-hmm. Finishing high school, I started working in a boutique studio, uh, which is a really great start. Taught me everything in terms of looking after people and developing those positive relationships. Mm. Uh, I then followed on and did a did some continuing study. Um, went to university, and in the follow on, I really started to, in the last five years, really uh, work my way towards working exclusively with with physique orientated athletes, and that's where we're at today. Yeah. So you started working with physique orientated athletes five years ago. You said. Yeah. So that's kind of yeah. when we started making the transition. Um, I had the pleasure of working alongside uh, one of my more recent mentors, Nathan Wallace. Um, shout out there. Another great physique coach. Again, might be worth getting on the show also. And um, he, we basically worked alongside one another for a couple of years there. And that's where I kind of uh, really upskilled in a lot of the practical aspects uh, and obviously transitioned into to working more dominantly with this uh, client population, which is kind of a, a niche within a niche. Uh, physique athletes so could be one in 20, and natural physique athletes could be two of that 20. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> definitely. And, um, yeah, I think something that also comes across in your, like, social media posts as well, because that's probably how I know the most, well, we know the most about you, but is, like, it's not just about the... I guess, uh, education and coaching, but also like the relationship between coach and client as well. And I think mm. especially that's really important for natural bodybuilding as well, as opposed to, uh, yeah, just like in other sports as well. Definitely. I mean, creating those, I think creating a, a coach and client relationship is is pretty challenging and it's probably part of the skill of coaching because particularly when you're working on a online platform, which is mostly where I work, you're reliant on creating a system or a relationship rather that allows for open and total honest uh, mm. kind of communication. And as a coach, I would define a good coach as doing what you can with the information you have. And number one is creating a relationship that allows you access to that. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. And I, I would imagine, so when setting things up with a client, again, how translating from long term, you really mm. want to have that long term relationship. So when you are, Definitely. because as a coach, I would imagine you would be in quite high demand. When a client comes to you, you want to make sure that 
you know, they're not just looking for something for four or eight weeks or something. You're going to be together for months or even years so that you really can develop that relationship, get to know them and really, really be a part of their long term journey. So how would how would you go about, I guess, in that case, kind of almost interviewing the client to make sure that they're in this for the long term so that you're not always changing clients per se? Yeah, I think that can be a bit of a challenging point. And I've, I've been asked on a couple of occasions kind of, what's your criteria for client for screening clients? And mm. I have a system, obviously, uh, within my consultation process. However, when it comes to my perfect client, I really look for people that exhibit certain traits or at least pers- sort of personality traits that I can build on. Mm. Um, and I think having a, a compatible personality is a good start. And within our consultation process, I'm pretty clear and concise in, in talking about my expectations in terms of what I want from them in terms of their training, nutrition, and can you give that, and uh, balancing their perceptions. Like, okay, guys, this is probably not going to be a three-month uh, exercise. Or if someone's come to me from a previous preparation, it was a bad preparation. They say they got mm-hmm. really thrashed. They mm-hmm. were under-muscled anyway, and they want to do – uh, a show in 15 weeks time I'm pretty quick to say I'm sorry it's never going to happen mm. I might say you need to give me 18 months and yeah. in the past it was hard to convince people of that they would say you know what don't worry about it they get completely screwed by someone else then they come to me and I got to work with them for two years to fix it yeah these days people are much more receptive to uh, at least people that come to me are more receptive to a longer term you know uh, system I think it's partly due to due to the sort of the emergence of more evidence-based uh, information within the social media circle. But also, if you if for example you follow me for a time, you probably get the gist that hey, yeah, I want to create something good, and it's going to take some time. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you're willing to put in the work, right? <laughs> exactly. And I work for the basis with my guys is that you know if you show me 100% effort, like I will give you my 200% in return which is exactly, uh, which is part of the reason why I'll cap my client load to make sure that I can give each of those people the attention that they deserve. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And how do you stay on top of your, the evidence-based approach? Because I know you follow, like, pre- basically everything throughout prep is very evidence-based for you and, yeah, you arrange it in that way as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, I mean, look, in terms of evidence-based practice regarding competition preparation, it's it's a it's something that it's obviously constantly evolving. Mm. Um, and it, definitely when it comes to uh, competition preparation, there's obviously limitations in the literature. And that's where you sort of, I suppose, merge the science. Sorry, just broke up there. So, yeah. um, and obviously the science is knowing what variables to manipulate, what systems these should influence. And the art is kind of knowing your athlete and knowing when to make these changes. And in terms of staying, in terms of staying current, I do make a point of participating in as much professional development as I can, mm-hmm. uh, particularly when the sort of the heavy hitters in terms of um, new emerging research relating to physique athletes come over to Australia, which is occasional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So like course. the, um, the yeah. evidence, uh, the ultimate evidence-based conference that was held down in Melbourne, I believe JPS is holding that again this year. Um, Jack and I are both really looking forward to going to that. Hopefully mm-hmm. Mike and Eric show up again. Yes. I mean, those guys, JPS, uh, Jacob and the rest of the guys do a very good job at bringing these guys over, which is fantastic. Uh, and since he's begun doing that the last three, two or three, I've made a point of, of attending those. So that'd be a good start. And obviously, um, these days, there's so much information at your fingertips. And if you're okay to liberate some funds towards it in terms of research reviews, et cetera, mm. uh, then definitely it's certainly worth it. As you guys know, once you finish university, you just all of a sudden don't have access to those great journals you did. Mm. So yes. uh-huh. uh, liberating some funds towards uh, research reviews, et cetera, is, is another great way of staying on top of our uh, constantly shifting landscape of evidence-based practice relating to bodybuilding prep. Mm, yeah, for yeah. sure. I get I get so excited when the um, the mass review is um, released every single month. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> and that mass is absolutely a fantastic resource. 
that one there, we as soon as uh, Helms and Knuckles brought that out, I got the lifetime membership. It is totally yeah. worth it. <laughs> I know it's amazing, isn't it? It's very exciting. <laughs> And yeah, something that we're also quite interested in regards to your competition history is uh, we understand you're an ICN pro, but have you ever considered doing any other natural federations like WNBF or yeah, any other ones at all? Great question. Yeah. So, I mean, most of my, my uh, <clears throat> training career or com- competition career rather has been spent between A and B and what was f- formerly known as IMBA. A and B were the first guys that I competed for. And then obviously I compete across federation between IMBA and A&B. IMBA, or what was formerly IMBA, as you guys know, is now ICN. So yeah. I actually turned pro with them when it was IMBA. Yeah. So in theory, I'm an IMBA pro. However, ICN has um, uh, essentially allowed that me to transfer with them in the crossover. I will, I will say in the coming year, when I do compete, uh, I am planning on going to the States and provided that I can qualify for WMBF Worlds, I would absolutely love to do it. It's just a matter of qualifying here in Australia because unfortunately mm-hmm. it doesn't exist yet. However, in the States, it is just the most unbelievable show that I can that I know of in terms of the quality of standard from a conditioning viewpoint. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. It's incredible. I think I've seen on social media recently, I think they're trying to bring it over here to Australia. So in the coming years, that's going to be very exciting uh, federation for all of us to consider um, competing Absolutely. in. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, I'll definitely give that a go. Um, there would have been a time where I would have considered doing IFBB for the sake of uh, essentially measuring up in a classic physique. However, after... Classic physiques integration within the first two years, it was no longer a natural man's sport. It just got yeah. too too size dominant again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't th- I don't feel as though I personally could could be competitive there. So <laughs> <laughs> keep it on the natural federations for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, well, especially when we already have such excellent like WNBF, like ICN does a great job as well. So yeah, um, there's certainly still competition for us. <laughs> And yeah, so moving on more to your own training and nutrition as well, we're both quite interested and I'm sure the listeners are to see what type of approaches you take, especially in things like, uh, because I guess the hot topics, which have been around for a while now is like IFIM in terms of nutrition, training to failure, reps and reserve and that sort of stuff. So yeah, sure. I mean, starting up, we can start on uh, flexible dieting. So I'll put it like this. I'm definitely a big advocate for a flexible approach. In that I think it's, um, particularly in the off-season, I feel as though it has longer-term application, and this is not something we're doing overnight. I think that there are certain personalities that a flexible approach works really well with from a competition preparation standpoint, and conversely, there are individuals that require a fixed or a more rigid approach for the sake of maintaining the adherence needed for preparation. Mm. So we have a setup within our coaching where we have essentially a series of video lectures in which we teach our guys how to flexible diet and how to do it very accurately. We then obviously follow it up with a really personalized, um, with some more personalized coaching. Um, so in a preparation for someone who's really proficient and they're fine to track protein, carbs, fat, and fiber at plus or minus two grams, which are the specifications that I desire, then we will flexible diet pretty much throughout the whole preparation. Uh, and like I mentioned, conversely, there are individuals that just require a bit more rigidity. So yeah. um, in those scenarios, we really modify the application of the nutrition dependent on the individual. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, see, I, I mean, I know that you guys, did you guys flexible diet through last preparation? Um, so, yeah, so we definitely um, followed a, we had macronutrient targets, which both of us, like you said, aiming for that um, five to ten, you'd go two grams. That's very, oh, yeah. very close. That yeah. is very impressive. Well, I'll, I'll just put it there. I went to, to two gram as well. So. Yeah, Jack would never <laughs> ever go one gram and over I, his carbs or fats. <laughs> I saw the conditioning you brought, so that doesn't surprise me. Um, Thanks. I mean, the, the basis I work off is that if if you if you can't measure it, you can't manipulate it. So there's only so many variables that we can tightly control to permit a specific response. So you, the, the variables we can control 
we really want to be on it. And nutritional yeah. input is is certainly something we can control. I think that when you're flexible dieting, even if uh, you're hitting your numbers perfectly, but you're varying your food selections a lot, there's always mm-hmm. going to be differences there. The thermic effect of food comes into play, and mm-hmm. obviously varied volumes of fiber <clears throat> will change your uh, gross caloric input, given that fiber is two to three calories per gram. So um, towards the back end, even if you're flexible dieting, you're probably sitting on similar sort of food types. Yeah. Yes, it's a, you're really trying to maximize that volume for sure. And it just happens to be you do get that from more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lean meats. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. You know, you talk to flexible dieters and they're like, oh, yeah, cool. You know, people that haven't dieted for a show and they're in the middle of their off season on these great high, you know, high calorie uh, intakes and they're consuming you know, quite a, a substantial amount of luxury foods. Uh, I think a lot of those individuals don't necessarily understand that flexible dieting when your calories are low is not inherently flexible. Yeah. You know, you're starting to think about, okay, I don't have, I have a limited quantity of total calories, a limited quantity of carbohydrates I need to specifically distribute uh, around my training. I need to dose my protein specifically to maximize postprandial muscle protein synthesis. And I need to make sure I'm getting enough volume so that I'm not hungry and yeah, I need to make crazy. sure enough, yeah, <laughs> enough variety so that I'm accumulating enough diversity in micronutrients. So it's, I think, um, exactly like mentioned, it's, it's not inherently flexible towards the back end. Mm. Um, yeah, it kind of comes down to, are you going to have potatoes or rice or oats, <laughs> depending on much, how many, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and oats have a bit more fat yeah. in them, so you might not be able to always have oats. <laughs> um, so yeah, moving on to training, I guess, um, is there a certain approach that you take or you tailor towards your clients as well? Um, I suppose we all have a system, a generalized system, however, how we apply it is obviously unique in application. Um I will work within standardized as a starting point, at least for my clients within standardized kind of uh, evidence-based recommendations. So two to three times a week training frequency at sort of 70 to 140 effective repetitions as a starting point. I'll generally build a system around the weak uh, areas uh, or the developmental deficits, particularly in an off season where we're in a energetic position to actually accrete protein and and actually fix the, uh, the deficit. So we might have two to three times a week training frequency with the lagging body part accumulating the third dose of training stimulus, which will be somewhere between sort of 10 and 15% additional volume. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm obviously really big on accumulating a dominant portion of our uh, training volume from big compounds, particularly the sort of bench squat dead barbell row pull up OHP variations, noting yeah. that if someone has a particular injury or perhaps uh, undesirable levers that don't fit those movements will always change it. Mm. That will be, however, if that isn't present, then these will sort of form the foundation. Uh, and then, of course, we work more peripherally, merging into uh, our isolation movements to sort of uh, round out the physique development. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, from a training frequency standpoint, in terms of total over the week, I generally ask somewhere between four and six times a week for my athletes. Uh, if someone comes in, they can only train four days a week. We'll make the most effective four-day program. But a five days sort of my median range, um, yeah. and that's generally where we sit. Six days is like, as a natural, really pushing it, six days is, that's pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what what's your opinion on, um, have you ever programmed for a client or even yourself, what, what's your opinion on twice-a-day training? Um, it's a really great question, and I actually – it's actually quite well timed because I was asked this question exactly uh, from a client of mine a few days ago. So I think that twice a day training provided that fits in with someone's schedule can be certainly included. And if you're looking at the same volume of sets, uh, if we split it over the, over two sessions over the day, it's quite likely you will accumulate to uh, better adaptation or maybe better retention of previous adaptation and periods of dieting. I just think it needs to work in with the athlete. Uh, mm-hmm. And in my scenario, for example, getting to the gym twice a day, it's not really a doable point, but I do have a couple of clients that will happily split it up. And I basically go, cool, this is the volume allotment you've got for the day. If you wanted to, slash if you need to, slash if you can, and you want to split that into two sessions, go your hardest. Mm-hmm. 
Great. And in that case, if someone was training twice a day, how would you suggest that they manage their nutrition because they need to refuel after and before both of those technically training sessions? Yes. And this is where I think this is where things get pretty challenging. Yes. I, if you're going to split up into two sessions, you're probably going to have one session that's going to comprise mostly your compound work and one that's going to comprise mostly your isolation work. If you're in an off-season scenario and you're sitting on 600 grams of carbs a day as a male, pretty mm-hmm. simple to, to direct your carbs around both those training sessions and ensure substrate mm-hmm. availability. However, I would imagine it pretty damn challenging in comp prep. <laughs> yes, for sure. In which case... To be 100% fair, I haven't actually done it in comp rep, but if I was to, I would likely look at prioritizing uh, substrate availability through carbohydrate consumption in the bigger session and then pulling whatever remaining carbohydrate you have to, towards the, the pre-training meal interval in the second session. Mm. Mm. And on, on the topic of carbohydrates, so there is a lot of evidence emerging in the fitness community relating to high carbohydrate diets for physique athletes, especially, you know, promoted by Broderick Chavaz and Mike Isertel yeah. and the like. Yeah. So uh, we would love to hear your opinion on, you know, high carbohydrate diets. Yeah, I think um, what I, I find this topic really fascinating, given that basically We've got a whole, we've got a body of literature that supports a higher carbohydrate diet, uh, in in favour of course of digging more aggressively into fats as a means of performance retention. However, I think if you look at the trend of coaches, physique coaches over the past, say even ten years before we had this, uh, such an extensive body of research, I think you'll find a lot of people were doing it at the start, mm-hmm. uh, you know, doing it for years, and I and logically it seems very illogic to favor a high fat diet i mean if we sit down and go look the training stimulus we're trying to capitalize on is predominantly uh utilizing glycolytic metabolic pathways hence if i want to maintain training within the suboptimal environment that is hypocaloric dieting it's pretty intelligent to ensure you have adequate protein adequate fat for you know adk say adek absorption and production of sex hormones etc and then you divvy up as much of your daily caloric intake towards uh, carbohydrate. And that's exactly what I do. There's a couple of um, considerations, noting that with females, their endocrinology is definitely more aggressively affected uh, by dieting as a whole. So there's some female specific recommendations we have in place in terms of dieting. And when it comes to macronutrient distribution, I will likely maintain uh, a bit more of a moderated fat intake, whereas males, I'm happy to dig that down to 0.5 grams per kilo mm-hmm. for short periods, noting that we would never do that for months on end. Uh, yes. However, for short periods, I have a uh, limited issue in doing that for the sake of uh, pleasing a calorie intake that's conducive to the loss we need and keeping the performance pushing along. Mm. So, so Most like. definitely. And yeah, I guess another nutritional strategy that has, well, in my opinion, it's probably been the one that has um a lot of probably the most controversy especially regarding like whole cheat days is the topic of refeeds and contest prep and mm. utilizing them effectively so how do you utilize them personally do you put them like once a week um in the latter half or yeah etc yeah um i certainly use refeeding strategies within comp prep uh and i will say that my take on refeeds in terms of how I implement them, how frequency and the frequency I implement them has changed over the years. And personally, I've done preps with refeeds and without refeeds. Mm. I actually did my first preparation with structured refeeds, my second without them and everyone following with them. Um, Mm. So I could personally dig into anecdote and go and and give you some insight there also. Yeah, that's great. Um, With my athletes, I'll certainly use refeeds. Uh, I refeed essentially from the beginning of preparation. Mm. I'll generally start with one refeed per week. This is a generalization noting that it's personal and in a perfect world, I actually increase the frequency of refeeds as we uh, continue through the dieting bout. So uh, I'll usually align a refeed with a period within the training week where we've got multiple days training in a row. Therefore, we're taking maximal advantage of the incoming carbohydrate. I'll usually refeed at around calculated maintenance uh, thereabouts. As mentioned, as we go through the dieting bout, I'll, I'll increase the frequency of refeeds. Uh, as you've seen with 
Liam, as you mentioned, he's running three to four reef feeds per week. Um, we're doing that in his scenario because he's exceptionally lean. We need to slow his rate of loss down. Uh, we slow that down, obviously, because we can only liberate so much uh, energy from fat mass per unit of time. He has a very small amount of fat mass left, so we need to slow it down to hold on to lean mass. Mm. And because it's very hard to maintain train performance at the back end. So if we yeah. have the pleasure of slowing things down, as in his scenario, it's quite likely we'll, we'll get the individual up to three refeeds a week and really only dieting for 50 to 60% of it. And, and your primary reason behind refeeds, so is that a combination of psychological, also hormonal? They still need to do more research on this, but in terms of trying to keep leptin levels high, and what is, what's exactly your reasoning for these refeeds? Yeah, I mean, the, the, my reasoning is essentially, is essentially a combination point. Um, there is limited research uh, that indicates any reversing of uh, the accumulated metabolic adaptation with short refitting windows. Uh, however, there's some compelling stuff that, that may suggest that longer refitting windows, like diet, moving to things like diet breaks of sort of seven to 14 days and beyond of maintenance may reverse some of the adaptation. For me, it's a combination of uh, the psychological aspect of um, the reward of having a higher calorie day. That's probably the smallest, uh, my smallest reasoning. My predominant reasoning is topping up muscle glycogen stores so that we can maintain training performance. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my predominant reason. Um, and any slowing slash reversal of adaptation associated with hypochloric dieting is just like a, a bonus point. Mm. Yeah, of course. And I know that there's some very interesting research coming out of um, the lab over in Western Australia with Jackson Pios. You're probably quite familiar with this, um, that he's doing this long-term intervention on physique competitors and with yes. implementing diet breaks every three weeks, which is, can't wait for that to, to be published. I'm so excited. It is wonderfully, it's super fascinating. And um, if you've, no doubt you've read his uh himself and Eric Helms and Lane did that review, which was essentially one of the most, well, I'd say the most comprehensive review of, uh, of literature on the topic. So it is very exciting. And it's um, awesome that we have a researcher here in Australia that's taking such a, uh, that's investing so much into this sector of, um, of the industry. It's totally awesome. Yeah, mm. I, I think the results from that study are just going to have huge implications on how coaches and athletes, you know, run their preps in the future. Certainly, certainly. Yeah. All right, so I guess now we can transition into how exactly do you set up a bodybuilding prep for a client? And I know this would probably be different for male and female competitors, but as we've spoken about previously uh, in the podcast about really giving yourself enough time, how has that changed for you over the years and how long a prep should last? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, obviously over the past few years, the conditioning uh, requirement to be competitive has completely changed. There was a time where if you had strider glutes, you were automatically a top three uh, place getter. However, that is essentially entry level requirement these days. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, Jack's stage debut was a, a great testament to that. Walked on stage, <laughs> strider glutes, first time, amazing. And um, and it was just a necessary point because the guys you were standing up with were just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, my planning becomes my planning comes before the actual preparation itself, in which case I'll usually have what I call a pre-preparatory phase, which is sort of based around two points. One is metabolic optimization through strategically increasing calories over time. And second of that is making sure we have a good starting point. So which I think is really important. When I talk about starting point, I'm talking about one, your starting body composition enough muscle, not too much fat mass, and second of that, your metabolic health. Um, you can be lean but be totally nailed from a metabolic yeah. standpoint from binge-restricting any behavior. Mm. So it's usually about 12 months out where we start to look at this sort of thing, at, at least 12 months out, ideally, that we look at this sort of thing. Um, if needed, we run a mini-cut somewhere around 12 months out, which is anywhere from six to eight weeks to essentially clean up any un unnecessary fat mass. And then a preparation as a standard for today's level of uh, figure or bodybuilding would be anywhere from sort of 22 to 30 weeks. I think that if you mm. require more than 30 weeks, you're probably a bit too soft to do this season. And it yeah. takes 
30 week preparation is show one and then a couple more shows thereafter. 34 weeks of dieting is mentally just mm. hard because preparation yeah, two thirds of the year. Yeah, it's crazy. Exactly. And as you know, preparation is abrasive. It's not like live a day in your shoes, Compline. That's easy, man. Do it for seven months. You know, yeah. if you drop, if you uh, pour water over stone for long enough, it degrades it. So mm. that's comp prep. It's just degrading. So, sorry, back to your question. So, um, I'll usually set it up at somewhere between 25 and 30 weeks. And this is going to be dependent on the starting body composition, the conditioning needed for the category, whether it's um, bodybuilding or, or figure, or of course, we start to go into fitness and bikini, we can, of course, afford a shorter, a shorter timeline. Um, I'll also take into consideration what I know from this individual in that there is likely uh, – a genotypic influence regarding one's proclivity to metabolize fat mass. You're going to have people that you know you can get in shape in 20 weeks and others that you know you're going to need that 30 weeks mm. uh, because they're a bit on the slower side. So that, yeah. of course, comes into consideration. You've got to know your athlete. And within our timeline, we're obviously going to factor in the total mass needed to be lost to be in shape. And then we'll also factor in the recovery. So we know that when we're overloading the off-season that we accumulate uh, fatigue over time. Hence, we need specific uh, non-progressive weeks like deloads to mitigate that accumulated fatigue. People often assume that it's unnecessary in comp prep. However, one could debate it's more necessary given that your recovery capacity is further reduced in periods of dieting. Mm -hmm. So we do have, where possible at least, again, this is a luxury. If we don't have it, if someone's come in late, then you're not going to do this. However, in an ideal sense, you would have deloads and diet breaks uh, at specific intervals, which uh, serve both as a means of recovery uh, and, of course, a break from the psychological rigor of, of dieting. Mm. So how? Um, so let's say that you have an athlete who is 30 weeks out. How would you judge their body composition? Do you use just visually, so just through progress photos, or do you take skin folds? Do you take measurements? How do you determine their initial starting body composition? This is a great, great question. So when I have the luxury of seeing someone in, someone in person, I'll do their surface anthro data, so their skin folds, and then we'll use a Jackson Pollock to, to come up with a, an estimated body fat percentage. Noting that the Jackson Pollock does not account very well for visceral adiposity. So mm. if someone's 10%, you're like, yeah, you're actually 16%. Um, <laughs> but we'll get in the ballpark. Uh, if someone has had a DEXA done, then that's great. Again, you got to note the limitations of DEXA scans. However, mm -hmm. it just puts it's just a ballpark. Yeah. For my online guys, I generally work a lot more off, off visual. So I don't get my online guys to do skin folds simply because most people haven't done their lab, you know, their level, at least level one Isaac course, mm. in which case they don't have accurate skin fold uh, testing methods. And if there's too much noise in the data set, you might as well throw it out. Yeah. So for those guys, I'm going to use a combination of, I'll assess essentially their total body mass, their body weight, take into consideration their height, and then obviously their, their visual. And then from there, I will make an informed estimation mm -hmm. <laughs> of where I think their stage weight will be. Um, mm -hmm. Rather overestimating than underestimating so that we're accounting for uh, more than we need within the timeline. And then we'll set our projections from there. And just anecdotally, I'm actually interested. Have you ever found that you have a certain clientele that you're either that either performs better, the ones that you're actually able to see in person or the ones that you're only able to see online? Or would you say they all turn out great in the end? Oh, look, I think it really comes down to personality traits. You know, I've met people that say to me, that see me in person and literally say, you know what, I can never work with you online. I have to see you in person. I think mm -hmm. that's totally fine. Uh, and opposed to that, I think generally the younger generation uh, totally fine working online. I think if we have an open line of communication, I'm confident personally to develop a system that is as effective online or as in person. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, me personally, I love working online as a client. Um, if I don't have to go out to, I don't know, um, go into Queensland Transport to update something, I'd rather do it online. If I don't have to go and travel two hours to see my coach, I'd rather do it online. And I think yeah. a lot of people share that. Uh, one thing I will mention, though, 
is that from a coaching standpoint, working online and in person are two completely different skill sets. Um, mm. I definitely feel as though it's possible to be, to be a great in-person coach and a really crappy online coach. And uh, so that's something that, that I found and obviously over the few, the last uh, bunch of years, you know, my service obviously continues to evolve and uh, and get better however i will say definitely that that uh online is very different and for a lot of people where it falls down is that they can't establish those relationships as we mentioned that that is really needed for for open communication yeah Mm -hmm. and do you take the same approach with posing as well do you usually start that quite far out and i guess ensure that everyone has it nailed and i'm very confident when they step on stage Yes, I'm, I'm really big on posing. I look at it and uh, as posing is essentially how you demonstrate your professionalism as an athlete. If, if you walked on stage and, and you can't pose, not only are you doing yourself a disservice in your look, but I mean, the, the, total, the overall professionalism as an athlete is degraded. So mm. starting early is always recommended. It's just, uh, and definitely there are people, that the natural athletes with great body awareness that pick it up really quickly. Uh, and those that take a little bit longer. But I would say from the start of your preparation, if you can at least have a fundamental understanding of the poses and then you can refine these over time. And Mm. if possible, I will usually recommend they see someone in person at some point just because if you're doing a front or bicep and you have someone that literally just grabs your elbows and positions them, I think that is priceless. And um, I usually will follow it up with, you know, Skype, uh, posing sessions in the form mm. yeah something that i think is quite uh, valuable as well as tailoring the posing to the specific athlete as well because because of people's different structures yeah some poses might be a bit different like mm. might be beneficial to like uh tuck your um elbow in more or like lean down a bit lower sit down a bit lower in the side chest or the side tricep as well so absolutely yeah. So important to to personalize that. And particularly, I mean, there's so much personalization within bodybuilding posing. And then once you sort of work your way down to fitness posing, you've got yourself, you know, much more variability again in terms of, you know, potential personalization. So it's definitely got to be got to be personalized. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So going back to the um, the long term of the prep. So you don't necessarily auto-regulate those. Do you specifically put in deloads and refeeds at specific times or would you auto-regulate anything there? Uh, we'll use a combination. So in that I like to be preemptive where I can, but I'll be reactive when I need. So mm-hmm. an example of that is actually uh, one of the guys doing season A. Uh, I had planned a deload in for him in a couple of weeks' time. We know we've got to deload and wash off this fatigue so we can continue to prep prepare uh with maximal effect he hit his wall a little bit earlier than i thought he knew it was coming uh the deload however he hit the wall and it was either a choice of you know what i've got the plan in place let's push on for another couple of weeks and kind of limp you to the deload slash diet break (laughs) with kind of not maximal training effect or let's just deload you right now and that's what we did so we have a I'll generally put it in place. We're going to do it roughly around this time, but if I deem it necessary to make an alteration, I will. And that's essentially where I think the art of coaching comes in. So read your client. You know, um, sometimes you're going to have to go by feel. And despite the best planning, uh, you know, you this individual might respond a little bit different through due to different environmental stresses, et cetera. So you've got to Got to definitely go by feel as well. Mm. And I think you've definitely demonstrated that with Liam again, because I, I have to ask him, because he is looking exceptionally lean right now and he's still he quite is. a few weeks out. Did you guys plan for him to peak this early so that he could eat up into the show? Or was he again one of those clients who loses weight quite quickly? C- can you explain a bit about his prep? Because it is quite sure. fascinating. For him, it was a bit of a yes and no. Like we always want to diet aggressively at the start and diet easy at the end. Um, and that's always our plan of attack. In his scenario, we hadn't planned to do an IFBB show. We kind of uh, threw that in a few weeks ago. We basically looked at him and said, cool, you're going to make under 70s just. 
uh, and you, you can be ready for this IFBB show. Let's do it. And that was about, I think, eight weeks out. We had planned to do an ICN show in the follow-on, which we will still continue to do, but he definitely did respond to protocols better than expected. I'll say that much. Um, if we weren't doing this IFBB show, we would have slowed him down much earlier on. However, we uh, decided to, to continue pushing along uh, obviously into this this show here. So essentially, in his scenario, we dropped pretty much 90% of the losses in the, the first two thirds, which which left obviously the remaining portion to, to uh, really refine the physique, which is ideal. Generally speaking, I like to be within two kilos of stage weight at about eight to 10 weeks out. Then we can just really slow things down. Yeah. Damn, that's awesome. And are you planning to... In that case, do you keep a competitor in a deficit or would you take an approach where you do try to slowly increase calories and eat up into the show so they look fuller? Yeah, uh, it's really dependent. So in Liam's scenario, we we actually uh, increase the frequency of his refeeds, as mentioned, as a means of reducing his uh, – as a means of maintaining performance but also slowing his rate of loss. We're now undergoing a little digging phase. We're actually pulling a refeed. We pulled a refeed down from four to three. Uh, that's for the next two weeks to sharpen him up that last portion. And then from there, we'll likely have to increase his uh, his low days as well. And it's likely that between shows, between the IFBB show and the follow-on shows, that we, will, we should have him essentially at maintenance. Just because uh, if we were to keep him in a follow-on, the same a deficit of the same magnitude with such a minimal amount of fat mass remaining, there's a high probability he's going to degradate lean mass. And we just can't have that. Yes, mm. of course. I understand. And yeah, so this, this probably will be our final question before wrapping things up, but yeah. I am interested to hear your thoughts about leading into peak week and peak week, peak week itself in terms of uh, energy balance. So, so I followed a, a carb depletion following into peak week and then i did mm -hmm. a a backload and i'm yep. not saying that's right or wrong i'm just interested in hearing your thoughts on what you do for your clients yeah i think uh like most uh answers it really can't it, the answer is it depends um mm. i don't generally conform to a front load back load or mid load protocol as being totally optimal basically the way i come into it is with an understanding of what our uh, goals are from a physiological standpoint. So obviously the nutritional goal is to maximize muscle glycogen and uh, take this already lean physique and basically exploit how lean it is with appropriate um, muscle volume. So it really depends. Um, if I've got someone that demonstrates really great uh, glucose metabolism and I know I've got to push them a little bit more for conditioning, I can generally afford a backload, I'll do so. It gives me a few more days in deficit, and I know I can mm. rapidly push that carbohydrate into muscle glycogen. I have worked with a few people that that are very, uh, let's just say not metabolically gifted, mm. in which case everything kind of happens in slow motion. For those yeah. sort of individuals, provided they're not doing back-to-back -back shows, I'll generally employ, you could call it a front load, but essentially a slow load from the start of the week. And with those yeah. individuals, you're really going by feel. This is what we're going to do today. This is what I think I'm going to do tomorrow. When you wake up tomorrow and you pump up, send me the photo. Awesome. Still flat. Do You're going to run an additional 40 grams of carbs on top of what I've already set, for yeah. example, and really titrate it like that. Um, mm. I'll say as a general, I don't generally backload. Don't generally. I have with success, but not generally. Uh, I don't generally backload women. Mm. In my experience, by the time a woman is completely peeled for figure, they're uh, somewhat compromised from a, um, a nutrient partitioning standpoint in that the incoming carbohydrates, if you're pushing it in at high doses per unit of time, they just generally can't partition it towards muscle glycogen at the mm. rates their male counterparts would, in which case a slower approach is much more uh, necessary in most cases. Yeah, mm. that's very interesting. And, and can you um can you perhaps bust some myths on perhaps competitors or even ho hopefully not coaches anymore um, that <laughs> manipulate like sodium and water and potassium during peak week? Could you um, say anything on that? I could probably say a lot on that actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes, absolutely. So 
I mean, as you guys know, um, the body is a wonderfully adaptive mechanism uh, and concepts of water depletion and manipulating intracellular and extracellular ions, although seems logic on paper, as you guys know, having a even having a basic understanding of of uh, one's physiology, it, it is flawed logic. Mm -hmm. So despite that, we still get guys that try and manipulate it, in which case we see people do like uh, electrolyte switch, switching electrolytes where they basically pull sodium, dose high potassium, and then all of a sudden try to do the reversal, um, which can be really, really dangerous, uh, mm -hmm. particularly when you're hyperhydrating and pulling sodium really low. You can obviously become a uh, hyponatremic. Uh, and in fact, in fact, last season, I had one of my guys, his, uh, let's just say his friend was working with someone who, who did exactly that protocol. I got a worry call from him. Hey man, my missus is, sorry, my, rather my friend is, um, <laughs> is not doing really well. Uh, she's really disorientated and she just can't string a sentence together. Um, uh, once he told me what this individual had her doing, um, you know, I, I basically said, look, it's not my place to say, to comment on someone else's protocols. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of her immediate health, you need to push some sodium into her. In which yeah. um, the response, as he put it, was pretty much immediate. Within 10 minutes, she was able to function again. So mm -hmm. um, people still do it. However, it's uh, totally unnecessary, potentially compromises the look on stage and very dangerous. I'll generally maintain a generalized uh, normal quantity of potassium and sodium through the week. Uh, if I push fluid up, which I occasionally will recommend a slightly increased uh, fluid intake, this is not to downregulate antidiuretic hormone, etc. This is just to ensure that you have enough fluid on board. Mm -hmm. And in those scenarios, I occasionally increase sodium just because you're going to be excreting more sodium. And then, of course, on show day, we're going to maintain our fluid consumption, taper it down ever so slightly before we get on stage so we're not walking on stage with a water belly and we will likely increase uh, sodium as a means of positively contributing to blood plasma volume and having the individual looking uh, full and lean on stage. Yeah, mm -hmm. helping it pumped up. I remember Jack, like about 20 minutes before his um, he stepped on stage, Alan got him to take a salt shot. <laughs> yeah, It is amazing to watch it, right? <laughs> yeah, it works like magic. I saw you use yeah. those um, sneaky little salt pills as well. I saw your post the other day about that. Yes, I um, I do use those. Uh, again, like if you can't, if you can't measure it, you can't manipulate it. So uh, yeah. sodium on show day, and so uh, exogenous forms of sodium. That's something I will I will track along the way as well. Yeah, but it's pretty instantaneous. Like when you've got an individual that doesn't have a lot of food volume in their gut, they're well hydrated, and you push sodium into them, stuck in and them to pump up. You can expect to see the result of that within sort of six to ten minutes. It's mm. it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I guess another thing that people don't think about is the sodium glucose transporter in your small intestine, especially yes. if people are trying to pull sodium, but then they're trying to load up with carbohydrates at the same time. They're not going to be able to absorb that glucose and they can run into a lot of gastrointestinal issues. So a lot of people really don't take that into account. Yeah, I think it's just, a, again, that's like you guys have this fantastic and in-depth understanding of those physiological processes. And I think this is just the kind of leftovers of what was essentially a, a sport built on tradition that was passed down from bro to bro. Like this is what that, you do. Doesn't it baffle um, you though, that literally everything is backwards. It's crazy. It, it's, it's all backwards. <laughs> oh my God. It really is. It's like, okay, we're going to pull fluid so that we can try and skew the fluid ratios of intracellular and extracellular sort of fluid. But within the extracellular compartment, we can further compartmentalize it into extracellular and blood plasma. But wait, wait, wait. I want fluid in the cell. I don't want fluid in interstitial space, but I want fluid in blood plasma volume. So when you think of it like that, like it just becomes fluid, mm. no fluid, fluid. Impossible, completely impossible, that is, to try and and have such an effect through external means. And I think mm. I think you can negatively skew the fluid distribution momentarily. Uh, however, your body is pretty quick to fix that. However, yeah. it's enough to stuff up. Yeah, exactly. And I guess this just reinforces the that everyone should really be doing their research when they come to look at a coach for 
contest prep because it's not just an issue about how you look but also your health as well so yes to anyone listening yeah that should be a priority when you do look for a coach so mm-hmm. totally a, 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 the challenging thing with comp prep is this, this is how i put it to people that um comp prep is it inherently healthy i say there are more unhealthy things to do than to prep mm. but prep is not uh no one comes to to you or i and says hey man i want to go on stage to be healthy yeah. our job is to get you to stage in the healthiest way possible mm. yeah. and that's um again like where the pr- where not just the protocols you use the back end but also like your pre-preparation someone comes to you metabolically compromised and you go yeah sure i'm going to smash you into the show you're going you're going to have a lot more aggressive negative effects at the back end mm-hmm. versus taking someone in a, with perfect health, having a really good timeline in place, there's a much higher probability that you're going to get to the back end of that prep. Everything's great. Uh, And with a swift reverse diet, you're back in an optimal status of health and ready to train. Yeah, exactly. And it could, it's not only damaging their health, but you have to think about, you know, your career as a coach. Again, do you want to be inpatient, you know, and get more people on stage or do you actually want to help people out I think I get uh, what you mean. You know, you can definitely, um, I think that thinking longitudinally again is, is really important. And I think that it's very hard for up and coming coaches. So when I started, I, all I wanted to do was, was please people's expectations. Someone comes to, when you're starting out and you want to get into preparing athletes for the stage, it's not easy. Someone comes to you and says, hey, I want to go on stage and you're a general PT it's like, oh my God, I have someone that wants to use my services to go on stage. And they say, I want to go on stage in six months time. And you're like, well, a physique athlete is a dime a dozen. I don't want to say no to this person. Mm -hmm. And this is where I see a lot of new coaches biting off way more than they can chew, either just flat out not getting the athlete in in shape or two, resorting to, you know, methodology that perhaps compromises health. So I think it's hard for those guys. For me, I'm much, I don't have a problem telling someone no or giving them the straight answer. And these days, people are more receptive to it. Okay, if that's what you really think, it's going to take me 18 months. Okay, I can do it. Exactly. Um, and people are going to respect you so much more as a coach as well. And, and the, it's, not, it's not going to damage your career because people talk to one another and people tell each other these horror stories. They really know who each other are. <laughs> that's true. Either they'll respect it uh, or they'll find someone else that will take their money and then come back to you in a really bad state and yeah. require an even longer duration to fix that and then to put them in a positive position in terms of lean mass and then to diet them. Um, mm. But generally, people are pretty good with it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, Brandon, I think we'll probably start to wrap up here. Again, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. I think the listeners are going to gain so much from this. But before we end the episode, we always ask our guests um, and we all say one thing that we learned this week. So it doesn't even have to be related to health or fitness, yeah. but just one interesting fact that you may have learned this week. And I'll, I'll, I'll start just to give everyone a bit of time. <laughs> so uh, this week I learned a bit about the, I guess, the physiotherapist industry in that a lot of the physios, well, in my experience, the physios are very tailored towards general population. Um, For example, like all sports physio and with my back injury, I've had a lot of trouble with finding a physiotherapist who's tailored towards resistance training or bodybuilding, powerlifting, etc. And yeah, I think there is a deficit in that industry. And I actually have been seeing a new physio who's based in Sydney and yeah, I've, I've benefited greatly from seeing someone who's actually a bit more tailored towards my specifications and actually understanding the mindset of someone as well who's passionate about bodybuilding. So, yeah. Super important. Yeah, definitely. I think that I think any athlete that's going to push their body to the limits always, it's likely despite our best you know, uh, interests, at, despite our best effort rather in minimizing injury, you likely accumulate something over, say, a 10-year training career. Yeah. And um, obviously, despite your best efforts in doing preventive work and managing your training, you know, there's, there's likely something in having someone in your corner that understands it. Because again, like similar to you in the past, I had, I did have an injury and it was put to me like, just stop training. And here's me at 19 years old. Like, you don't understand. Um, yeah. <laughs> all I want to do is train. So 
yeah. having someone that goes, look, I understand uh, what you're training uh involves perhaps i can recommend these modifications mm. and and keep you pushing forward whilst working around it so i mean i'm stoked you got someone in your corner that, that does that for you thanks because um i can only imagine how frustrating it is to to have such an injury yeah mm. and i think there's a huge difference between a physio you know getting you to do three body weight squats in their in their appointment room compared to actually watching you with a hundred kilograms on your back doing, you know, a set of 10. There's Definitely. a huge difference there. And that's a great physio. If they, if they, if they're willing to review a couple of videos and go, look, well, what are the movement patterns that contributed to this dysfunction that eventually led to injury? Um, yeah, exactly. That's awesome. So Brandon, what's one thing that you learned this week? Uh, one thing I'll tell you what, this is completely not fitness related. Tell you what, my skill set is totally geared towards my profession. Outside of that, I'm pretty useless. That means I'm not very handy at all when it comes to anything. This week, I have been learning how to uh, how to paint my house, uh, <laughs> which has been uh, uh, a mission. So my uh, new skill for the week is exactly that, like how to how to cut in, how to paint my house, which has been a uh, been probably harder than bodybuilding to be honest <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, i wouldn't know the first place to start so. <laughs> but uh yes and uh once again guys thank you so much for having me on it's been uh fantastic to uh share some anecdote and share some general knowledge with your viewers mm. yeah thank you so much and where can our listeners find you and get in contact yep yeah, uh so i am of course on facebook and instagram you can find me on instagram just under the handle brandon Cantor. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. However, I don't have a business page on there, but I do maintain a personal profile. You're welcome to uh, add me as a friend, drop me a message, or uh, follow me on there. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. So, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If you enjoyed it, please take a screenshot, post it to your Instagram stories. Make sure to tag Brandon, tag Jack, tag myself. You can tag the Bodybuilding Dietitians. And we will catch you next week. See you guys. <laughs>